Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show that brings you leadership lessons and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Lisa Lipkin. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell icon below. So I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite writers, Mark Twain. He said, New York City would be a wonderful place if only they'd finish it already. And um, in a certain way, that's how I feel about our guest today, Steve Cohn. Uh, he seems to be a man who is perpetually unfinished, constantly evolving like New York City in a way that I have such admiration uh, for. So a little bit about our guest today. Um, Steve Cohn is a founding partner of a law firm called Pollock Cohn, which among other things specializes in whistleblowers and class action lawsuits. But what's intriguing about um, Steve is that long before becoming a lawyer, he had multiple lives. He worked in advertising where he won two Clio awards, publishing, including stints at Time and Scholastic. Um, he even created and produced Time Magazine's Man of the Year documentaries. He served in the Navy. He wrote seven books, co-chaired Hillary Clinton's White House Task Force on Early Childhood Literacy and launched a number of startups. But then something dramatic happened in 2009. So from what I understand, you know, life can always go in various directions according to the smallest things. And in your case, you got drunk at a party. So why don't we well, start? I, wouldn't think, well, I wasn't out of control, but I was showing off. You were like a nice Jewish tipsy. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Contradiction in terms. <laughs> yes, it is. No, tell me what happened in 2009 that sort of changed the course of your life. I was at a post-Christmas party. And I was telling someone I had just met at the party, a woman who had just been introduced to me about an article I had written. I had just finished serving as a juror on a big terrorism trial here in New York. And I wrote about it. In fact, I thought if I told the judge in advance that I was going to write about it, he wouldn't put me on the jury because it took about four weeks. But he said, if you can be fair, just don't write about the trial during the trial and you're on. And I did serve and we convicted and I wrote an article about it. I was telling a woman, this woman who I just met and she was all actually was paying. She thought it was interesting, which was shocking in itself, but she liked the, the story. And then she said something that was prophetic. She said, don't be a wise guy. I, I, she asked me if I were a lawyer. I said, no, I just dress like one. She said, don't be a wise guy. I said, forgive me. My wife is at the other side of the room. She'll confirm I am a wise guy, but tell you the truth. I'd go to law school now if I didn't have to take the LSAT, the admissions test. And she looked at me as if I were completely crazy. She said, at your age? I said, yeah, at my age. She said, okay, you're accepted. Write a check, show up on August 15th when classes start and you're in. I said, who are you? She said, I'm a dean, New York Law School. You're accepted. And that's how I wound up going to law school. And so you, I loved you it. Started, you started law school at 58? At 58. And you loved it. it. It made me 20 years younger, probably 20 pounds heavier. Um, it, it made my brain work in a way that it hadn't worked in a very, very long time. And it was a challenge. And I lo literally loved every minute of it. You had been you came from the world of publishing. I did. And, and do you think that that experience sort of helped you in law school to some extent? Not a bit. Not, not a bit, Lisa. No, no. It was um, knowing how the world worked help me and having different stakes than the other students. And it was, it was interesting. I went to school in the evening, what I refer to as night because it went on until 10 o'clock at night, but which the school refers to as evening or part-time student. I had been an adjunct for 30 something years in MBA programs at NYU and Fordham. I taught in the summers, but it, when I taught at NYU and Fordham, I always taught at night and I had no sense of what a jerk I had been to students all those years because I had no real appreciation for how tough it was to be an evening student until I became one. And now I have this enormous, enormous respect for anybody who pursues an advanced degree at night. It's really hard juggling job, school, family, relationship. It's tough. And I have enormous respect for people who can do it. And, you know, um, what's so it's just fascinating to me. No, number one, 
where did you learn this idea that it's okay to start again at any age? Because I must tell you, I, I have been living in Europe for the last 15 years. Um, and, and that notion is quite an American one. Um, the idea that you get to start again at almost 60 is to me seems profoundly American and very optimistic. And I'm just wondering where that came from in your own life. Well, I have no idea. You know, my, my mother, God bless her, worked until the day she died at 92 and it kept her vital. She literally, you know, she was working in the garment district and she had a stroke and she died at her desk um, at 92. And I mean, she was so vital just exploring and selling and meeting people. And it was an inspiration. Um, the first really rich person I ever met was in New York after I had moved here. It was my, a year or two after college. And he said he returned every phone call he received within 24 hours. And he said the first calls he received every day from, from the people whose names he didn't recognize because he never knew what opportunity was at the other end of the line. And that influenced me a great deal. I mean, it's an adventure. As you said, the Mar I, you know, I thought you were going to quote a different Mark Twain quote, which I often use that if I had had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. But yeah, I, I like the one you did. If, if they ever finished New York and if they ever, you know, for me, you know, what's the next opportunity? What's the next adventure? What's the next thing I have to learn about? But, but clearly you're you're fueled by an unspoken or perhaps even subconscious sense of optimism, the idea that anything is possible and that more that that transcending difficulty is possible and 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 nowhere does that, is that illuminated more than um, than this than what you're doing right now. I mean, among other things, you're you're taking on the biggest behemoth in the world, the city of New York, in a pretty amazing class action lawsuit. And if I if I know, and again, you'll explain it to me, but from what I understand, the city has decided to, to try to basically um, not give their city employers a huge amount of health benefits um, that they are entitled to. This is not something that any, any person I know would want to take on. You must, you must be driven by A, a sense of justice, and B, a real sense of optimism. I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I I actually share with you the perception. I'm I'm a very optimistic person. I mean, I, I wake. I, I'm a half glass full guy, absolutely, and wake up and say, you know, what's the challenge of the day? You know, what what adventure am I going to encounter you know, today? Um, I hate bullies, and when I heard from some retirees what New York City was trying to do to 250,000 retired police officers and firefighters and teachers and sanitation men. It just seemed wrong. And I'm pretty sure the city was counting on no one challenging what they were about to do, because something I didn't know until I started this a couple of months ago is that former union members, whatever union you're in, are no longer represented by their old union. Now, of course, it makes sense when you think about it, but I had no idea. So there are about 250,000 New York City municipal retirees, and they work and they believed, every single one of them, that when they retire, whatever terms were, whether it's 20 years or 30 years or you know, however much they got for their pension, they were entitled to two things. One was a pension based on how much they earned and how long they worked. And the second was health benefits. And they were told that. Rarely was it written down, but we found places where it was written down. And New York City came up with, understandably, a way to save about $500 million a year. And they figured this out a couple of years ago and said, okay, let's see if we can get away with it. Because who doesn't want to find a half a billion dollars a year? And it goes on year after year after year, and it actually grows. And what they figured out is if they could move retirees from the health plan that they were promised and which they've enjoyed for the last 40 years to a less good plan known as a Medicare Advantage plan, the entire cost of providing it shifts from the city's budget to the federal budget. Completely, half a billion dollars a year right now. Who doesn't want to find a half a billion bucks, you know, in, in a, behind the, uh, the the sofa cushion? So they've been trying to do this, and I think they were counting on nobody organizing 
and trying to challenge it. And I is was a pro. Is it such a bad thing? Is it such a bad thing to, to move it to Medicaid? Well, it, it's noticeably worse. for, And it's worse in three ways. First, and the most significant, is that doctors do not have to participate in what's known as Medicare Advantage plans. Medicare Advantage is not a government plan. It's paid for by the government, but it's private insurance. And it's been around since the Clinton administration. And it was an attempt to create a public-private approach to manage healthcare. And it has some good things. It has some, a lot of bad things. In fact, when I testified before the New York City Council a couple months ago, there were about 300 people in the chamber. And I said, I think I'm the only person in this entire room who actually has a Medicare Advantage plan. And because everybody else there was fighting it. Well, I have one. And there are good things, and there are lots of bad things. And the most significant is that not all doctors accept it because the pay is the reimbursement rate to the doctor is significantly lower. Second thing that's really important is that well, Medicare does not engage in something called prior authorization or pre approval of various procedures, whether it's a, an MRI or a surgical procedure. Medicare Advantage does. In fact, what we found out, and one of the reasons we were able to stop the plan, at least for now, and still the legal argument is going to be heard by the court, but they stopped its implementation, is that there are 87 different tests and procedures that retirees will now be subjected to because of Medicare Advantage. And the third thing is they're trying to impose co-pays. And for people who are living on small fixed pensions, $15 here, $15 there, $15 again. And you're seeing seniors and, you know, and disabled retirees are seeing four, five, six doctors sometimes a month. Mm -hmm. That adds up. So it's a real diminution in their health care benefit. You know, uh, many people who are listening to this podcast don't live in America. And, and, and health care, by the very nature of where they live, is a right, not an, you know, an uh, uh, option. How do you feel about it philosophically, you know, that we that we do this to our citizens? I know when I moved to, to Europe um, and suddenly for the first time in my life, I didn't have to consider my small thyroid condition pre-existing and therefore unaffordable. No. It really changed my life. Uh, the stress reduction alone in knowing that I wouldn't wind up in a box if I had a medical condition made a huge difference to me. Well, nobody knows if I'm a Democrat or Republican. And that's the way I try to keep it. I'm in favor of single payer and healthcare is a right. I think people need that level of comfort and assurance and care. And what we have now, this hodgepodge of public and private is simply onerous and it, it really doesn't work for too many people. So I, I'm much more in favor of various European models than I am of what we have here today. I mean, I, obviously you, you're, you're representing I mean, I consider you one of the good guys. I don't, I don't usually Thanks. say that about lawyers, but I, I'm, I am very curious how you, you, you know, you've written about um, the value of social housing. I, I happen to to live in one in in New York, and and I Penn South, and I value it tremendously. Um, you've you, you've represented whistleblowers, and and you know, basically, you're on the side of, I think, the the average man. And I just wonder where did this come from in your own life. Well, it's interesting. I, I've been really lucky in my life. And part of it, I mean, I, I, I was, as you said, I served in the Navy a long time ago. I believe in service. I've been writing a lot about nat compulsory national service. I think everybody should serve, um, you know, for two years. Why? Because I think as citizens, we owe each other something. Um, I think we owe our society. It's not just give me, give me, give me. So I, I'm, a I'm in favor of um, mandatory national service, not military, but national service. Um, and I, I am not, as I said before, I, I really don't like bullies. And I've been lucky enough when I met my partner, Adam Pollock, we were both working on not different sides of a case, but again, a whistleblower case. And he was an assistant attorney general here in New York. And we pursued that case. And it's funny, we're not allowed to talk about that case because it's now settled, it's sealed. But when I was thinking about what I wanted to do and he had, was leaving the attorney general's office, we talked and we said, could we create a firm that focuses on what we call public impact law? It's not about who can make the most money, 
who can bill the most hours. But how do you make a difference? As he puts it, you know, lawyers have very special skills and very special forum, the courts, to accomplish things. And we identified some areas that we're, and we're, we're very different people, we have very different interests, but to right some wrongs, not all wrongs, um, sometimes we don't agree on politically, but we, you know, we agree on the cases we take. We said we want to do three things. We want to support whistleblowers. And the whistleblower law that we use mostly has been around since 1863, since President Lincoln got it passed. The second are class actions. And the third, what we call general impact, public impact. And the best example of that is our third partner, Chris Leung, took on big tobacco and the government and won a major case a year ago that's going to ban menthol cigarettes because menthol cigarettes have incredibly insidious impact, particularly on African-American families. It, you know, it masks the tar and the nicotine, and it has a, a terrible, terrible impact. And Congress said to the FDA, you have to do something about this. And the FDA, because of a lot of lobbying, was dragging its feet. Chris got some medical associations behind this, they were our clients. We challenged it, and Chris won. And now menthol cigarettes are going to be regulated and banned. So that's the sort of thing we want to do, and we try to do. But 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 you're still evading the question, which is, um, and by the way, it's fabulous the work you're doing. But I, you know, I know from my own personal experience, growing up as a trauma as the child of a traumatized a war victim. Yeah. that I be, had, I sort of developed a hyper radar to, to other people that were in pain. And through no fault of, of my own, it's just sort of inherited epigenetics, if you will. And yeah. I just wonder your early days, for example, were you perhaps bullied yourself or- No, not a bit. And I don't think I was a bully, but no, I was not bullied. And I had this- I were... <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, I, I grew up in the Wonder Years TV show. Oh. I mean, it, it was so, you know, it was suburbia, you know, on, on Long Island, it was lower middle class, middle class. I was the first person in my family ever go to college. I was a lucky guy. And, but, you know, my, my father, my grandfather, my uncle all served in, in the military during the wars. Wow. And I, I grew up with a sense of, you know, of a sense of a little bit of responsibility. One of my sons is a Marine today, a career Marine. Wow. And, it's, so I don't know where it comes from, but there is the optimism, there is this dislike of bullies and a belief that one person can make a little bit of a difference. And so trying to contribute, make that little bit of a difference. This is a sort of strange question that you're gonna think has nothing to do with your work, but perhaps it does. Um, I know that you happen to be a, a passionate um, racket sports guy, right? Um, <laughs> I know you play this new game called pickleball, which is sort of like tennis, but a smaller, something between tennis and, and ping pong. And I don't know whether, are you a tennis player as well? I used to be. I had yes. two hit, I was a squash player actually. And I'm I wasn't, squash. I'm a terrible athlete, but I played everything. I played in college and I played after college, but I was the, I was the last person picked on a team. And yet I was too stupid to know that I wasn't an athlete. However, um, I am curious um, what, since you're, you claim you're not a good athlete, but I know you're a good pickleball player and I know you're a good tennis player. What did you, what strategies did you bring from the legal world that you apply to the, to the pickleball court? It's, it's funny. I have, um, it's not so much I bring from the legal world as I brought from the, the squash court. I was never fast. I was never strong, but I developed a deceptive drop shot and a lob. And so in the law, you know, I, and I, I work for a wonderful, wonderful lawyer named Tom Moore, one of the best trial lawyers in America. And Tom and his wife, Judy Livingston, taught me, you read the record 50 times. It doesn't mean you show the other side everything you have. You hold something in reserve. Hmm. And I try to do that both. On, I wish I could do it better on the pickleball court. But, you know, you, you, you try to keep a little bit in reserve that can be deceptive. And, and are you are you working on an, an other class action suits now that are pretty fascinating? We, we are. Um, we are representing small business owners in a terrific, important class action against ClassPass. 
you know, we're talking about health, um, you know, health clubs and nail salons and class. I don't know what, maybe you can explain what class pass is. I don't know it. Yeah, cl- class pass is uh, an online service where you buy for a certain dollar amount, a pass to various types of services. Um, I, again, spas, nail salons, gyms, and you get to do it at a slight discount. Mm-hmm. Except that ClassPass never got the permission of the small businesses and basically are forcing small businesses to accept their reduced payment. And so we've taken on ClassPass, which just had an enormous IPO, and we've, we're helping lots of small businesses get what's due to them. That's amazing. Now, now, you know, I started this interview by talking about your capacity for reinvention. I have no doubt in my mind that this is not the last chapter of your life. So what comes, what's the next chapter in terms of reinventing yourself? Well, I would like to get this right. Um, You know, I've only been a lawyer for eight or nine years now. And happily, we just, last week, we hired our 10th and 11th attorneys for the firm. And so- yeah. You've and grown in, in 10 years, you've grown to this extent? In, no, no. In four years, we've grown. What? 11 lawyers. Yeah. Um, and wow. learning how to do this right is important. Um, and motivate, you know, the best boss I ever had was a man named Don Sider, whom I worked for at Time Inc. Um, at T- Time Life, Time Inc. You know, um, it was before it became Time Warner. And Don said, Everybody we hire here is smart. We have that ability to attract and hire really smart people. But no individual is as smart as any two of you. Mm. And it's my job to get you to work together because it's a force multiplier, to use a military term. If I can get people, it's not one plus one, it's two. It's one plus one equals three. So my, my main job is I'm relatively junior lawyer is to, and I don't, I don't think I provide a lot of adult supervision, but I provide a lot of experience and perspective. And it's to ask lots of questions and to get people to work together. That's what my, my next act is all about, is to really get better at that. Because I learn from the young people I work with every day. Um, and they keep me on my toes. And it's, you know, we think about, we talk about, you know, what types of cases do we want to try to bring in, Um, you know, what wrong can we actually help right? And we have, you know, we have lots of cases and it's, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, Uh, in this cynical era with the courts changing so dramatically, including our own Supreme Court, do you still um, resist the, the urge towards cynicism? Oh yeah. Cynicism will get you absolutely nowhere. Um, Having a healthy skepticism is important. Because again, it helps to understand how the world works. What is the judge trying to do? You know, if if you believe the judge really tries to be a a fair arbiter, and I do, and there are exceptions to this, there are judges who are not. But you know, what is it? What can you provide to a judge so he or she says, "Okay, I'm going to lean a little bit more." in your direction than on the other side, because it's never bl- completely black or white. And, you know, to, to make that case, to, and you, ha- you have this experience, to tell a story that's understandable and compelling. It's not just about the law. It's really- yeah, about you, the I think you word. wrote early on an, an article about how juries respond to evidence. Maybe you could just add, share a little of that before we end our interview. I'm fascinated. Sure. Well, look, I, 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 One of the few people, some would say I'm one of the few schmucks you'll actually meet who's actually been on four juries through verdict. I don't try to get out of jury duty. And in each experience that I've had, and I guess there were three criminal and one civil case, jurors really try to do what's right. They pay attention. They follow the judge's admonition to presume innocence and to really listen to the evidence and see where it takes them. And I have great faith in the jury system. You know, if, if I'm ever in trouble, I'm asking for a jury trial. I, I do too. You know, a lot of Europeans think a professional jury is the way to go. But I, I think if you've never sat on an American jury, you don't realize how the integrity that most people bring to it. And um, 
and and I suppose that in in turn, when you're up against a jury, you're you're being as honest and as passionate as you can as well, right? Because yeah, it was, you know, Tom Moore said something to me early on after I, I met Tom Moore because I was a juror on one of his cases and I wrote about it. And it was a seven week trial. And I asked him a question in the follow up interview. I said, do you watch TV shows, the law TV shows? And I guess that time, um, L.A. Law was the big one. And he said, absolutely, because that's what jurors expect. That's what they want. They want a bit of drama. They want the storytelling. They want the passion. And so I try to do that as well. Well, I, I feel your passion and we've only been talking for 25 minutes. So I really, I feel like we're just touching the tip of the iceberg, but I really wish you so much success with all your cases and maybe you'll come back and report on how they're all doing at some point. But thank you so much for sharing some of your wisdom with us today. Well, there's no wisdom, but thanks for having me. I'd love to come back. It was a pleasure. Happy holidays to you. And to you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.